Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Real Organic Project is a farmer-led movement that provides an add-on certification held by over a 1,000 certified organic, family-owned operations across North America. Real Organic Project strives to uplift farms working within the spirit, not just the letter, of organic principles. Real Organic certified farmers use practices that are centered around the foundational organic principles of soil-based crop production and pasture-based livestock agriculture. To remain accessible to all types of farmers, Real Organic Project fundraises year-round to keep this certification available at no cost to farmers. You can apply today at realorganicproject.org forward slash thriving farmer. That is realorganicproject.org forward slash thriving farmer. The current application season ends soon, so be sure to apply today. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today my guest is Reese Jones of Jones Family Farm and uh, growing up on a retail-oriented vegetable farm in Southern Harford County. Reese Jones is 26 and currently is the co-owner and manager of Jones Family Farm, as well as president of Victory Gardens, which is a social enterprise aimed at growing culturally relevant food for marginalized populations in the Baltimore Harford vicinity. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. So t- share with me a little bit, um, social enterprise. What does that mean to you? Okay, so social enterprise is a business that focuses on uh, assisting others. It's supposed to be mm-hmm. for the benefit of the community. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually a really big movement right now away from the traditional uh, nonprofits and actually call it more social enterprise because there's a lot of negative uh, connotations that come with nonprofits with whether it be like the CEO salaries uh-huh. or just a mishandling of money. In, in nonprofits. So we, of course, I'm going to be applying for my 501c3 status, which is yeah. this nonprofit status, but terming it a social enterprise puts it more into an arena of its own and you get to define it, which is what's so wonderful about it. Yeah. So, I think you're also looking at the problems with, you know, nonprofits where 80% of the income is going for out to just get more money. It's for fundraising instead of actually what actually goes to the people. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, the social enterprise is way more focused on, hey, we'll definitely have to do some fundraising, but majority is supposed to be actually programming or production. Yeah, the first place I could think of is Thistle Farms, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, which is an organization. I, I don't even think it's not a corporation. It's like a family owned business. Mm. Um, I don't even think they're considered a nonprofit, but what they do is they grow lavender plants and they they educate. And they grow it with members of the, of the community who've been sexually yep. abused in one way or another. Great organization. But I, I modeled it after what they threw out. Yes. Very, very cool. So talk to me a little bit about the, let's first start with the farm. So you've got the Jones Family Farm. Share a little bit about that and how that came to be and like the history behind it. Yeah. So so my father, he started growing vegetables in the 19. 19- 70s, early 1970s. Yeah. We have the same name, Maurice Jones. And uh, he started on the side of the road, right on Route 40, about 20 minutes north of Baltimore City, um, just growing green beans, sweet corn, tomatoes. Uh, he picked it all himself and he would sell it on that wagon up against the highway. Okay. Um, and he started doing that when he was 12 years old out of a little garden that he started with his grandfather, my great grandfather. Yeah. Um, slowly but surely, the snowball started tumbling, and it just started selling more and more items. And yeah, he ended up buying his first farm when he was 16 years old, and it was right across the street. Well, thank God he did that because five years later, after his dad, my grandfather, came back from being in the army, um, uh-huh. my great grandfather, his father, uh, ended up selling the farm, which was crazy. They originally, they were, my family was a really big vegetable farm in, in central Maryland. And um, they, my great grandfather thought that he didn't want his kid to have to work as hard as he's had to in his entire mm. life. So he kind of sold it from underneath my grandfather and my father and forced them off of the land 
And so they migrated across the street where they started building another produce stand. Dad bought the, um, Dad built that produce stand when he was like 18, 19. Yeah. But what was really cool about that is um, he didn't want to stop there. My, my father never stops. Um, yeah. He ended up being able to, with the, with the sales that he made at that produce stand when he was 18, 19, he ended up going to John Hopkins University in Baltimore and we got a degree in civil engineering. Uh -huh. After that, he came back to the farm. He didn't want to work as an engineer, but he wanted to have that education. That's what's so important for farmers, especially nowadays. It's not just yeah. about your ability to throw a seed in the ground. There's a lot more things to it. Yes. And so he came back with a lot of knowledge, a lot of comprehension about the real world sales. And so um, just from, from that point on, he purchased another farm up the road. And we've been growing vegetable farms ever since. In 2001, we purchased a farm that was 20 minutes up the road. And my dad started growing Christmas trees because he thought that uh, uh -huh. far, like farmers markets, I'd say between the 90s and the 2010s, were on the decline because grocery stores were taking up a lot of the sales that, that we traditionally would have had. There's not many farmers left in my area because of that. Yeah. So my dad diversified and was like, what can grocery stores not do? grow Christmas trees. So yes. we've been enjoying Christmas tree sales since 2012, 2013. And that's been a blessing. Christmas trees are awesome thing to grow. It takes a lot of heart, it takes a lot of love, takes a lot of years. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. 15 years. But yeah, that's definitely a diversification that nobody else can beat. Yeah. And how many acres of Christmas trees do you have? That's a great question. Um, I'm looking out the window here. Do some math in my eyes, my brain. Um, I'd say so. We do about fifteen acres of vegetables on plastic mulch. So yep. I, I would I would say we probably do about twenty five acres of Christmas trees. Okay. We plant about three thousand a year. Okay, gotcha. And I'm assuming those are super hot because, um, like right now, there's a national Christmas tree shortage. Oh yeah, yeah. We get a lot of people come from all over the area, but it's, it's northern Hartford County, northern Maryland. It's kind of like a hub. There's a lot of different Christmas trees farms because okay. the the slopes of the land makes it so you can grow Fraser firs, which is the primary yep. Christmas tree you can grow, yeah, um, and sell. So, I mean, I I love it because it brings in the families. I'm such yes. a people person. I yes. love seeing people have um, smiles on their faces. We used to do a uh, a Halloween hayride. Yeah, uh, like seven years ago, we stopped doing it because that crowd is that is not a family crowd. That is teenagers and that is older people who want to get scared. And if they're not scared, they get mad. OK, interesting. So you actually shut that down because it didn't create it wasn't the customer you wanted. Um, There was a couple other aspects, too, but we yeah. didn't. It, so we had to move to a different farm. We rented from that farm. Ah, and so yeah. when we migrated away from it, uh, we decided not to continue it, even though we could have had all those customers come back because we had our name and a brand out there. But we didn't want to continue yeah. it because we were busy with other stuff. We wanted to focus on yeah. things that put smiles on people's faces, not yes. yeah. horror. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that is something that I, the more the more fall people I talk to, they tell me just how much money they make. I mean, those fall, those fall experiences print money. I do. Um, and, uh, I was just doing the calculations with a, of a local place here. And I think they probably do between seven and $9 million a year off their fall haunted experience. Oh yeah. I know uh, farms that do Christmas trees and the Halloween experience, which is perfect because literally they're only open October, November, and December. They're closed the rest of the year. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It, it is yeah. really nuts. How much, I guess we make. replace that with school tours, which yeah. I love. I love educating people and yeah. we've, like book saw the entire month of October, every single day we've got school school buses coming and we get to do that. So really? I guess we replaced it with other income tours. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about how those work. Um, so what, when the tour comes, what kind of experience do you look to give them? We give an introduction about kind of like what we just did, Michael, just like yep. talked about how my dad started and how important yep. education was, uh, how important it was for him to bring his kids back to the farm and to continue the legacy of what farm, what a farm yeah. work is, um, all the cultural aspects of it. And then we always try to get them to use their hands. A lot of these kids come from inner city Baltimore. They don't know where plants mm. come from, where vegetables come from. When they pull rash out of the ground, 
they're like, whoa, <laughs> the ground's <Yeah>. bleeding. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So we get the, they get the pick stuff. Okay, so then the other side of this is, do you, uh, how do you create those relationships with the teachers? Is it something you just have a, you just have a, uh, a, uh, a, a reputation for that now and they all talk about themselves? Are you actively marketing, trying to get more people to do that? Or how do you build this into your system? Um, it, one, one of the, so one of the ways is definitely our CSA program. Um, we have about 400 members and a okay. lot of them are, I want to say a lot of them, I'm going to say about 10% of them are actually people in the education system. So they get our name out there that way. Yep. And then through our social media, they're able to see the type of activities that we engage in. Cause there's like a certain suspicion that like customers have, like, do they really grow this? Yes. You no, know, I don't believe it. But you know, when you go on social media and you actually see the videos, you see the pictures of yes. me hand planting 4,000 tomato plants into plastic mulch. They know that it's real. And so yes. I think that degree of trust that social media creates along with those CSA connections that we have really helps. Um, and then like second, uh, Farm Bureau, which is a great organization that we're a part of, um, that Farm Bureau is an interest group for agriculture in Washington and, and local politics yeah. as well as grassroots. Um, we have a lot of, that, that, that's supposed to be semi-education based. And so yeah. we have a lot of teachers and, and presidents and, and, and principals coming to us at Farm Bureau asking like, who are some farmers who are interested in hosting tours for us? And that was another way we got picked up with our name. You got to get your name out there in more ways yeah. than one. Yeah. And do you have a team that does the tours for you now, or is that something you actually do? We do everything ourselves. Okay. Oh yeah, right. everything is, and I and I love it. It's my sister and I, Alice yeah. and I. We we pretty much run everything. Allison takes care of the retail segment, and then I take care of growing everything. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And All so right. we we go back and forth. I mean, I majored in horticulture in college yeah. and then business, and so I got. I have to tone it down for the younger kids, but I could really get into the science and everything. I, I enjoy yeah. all those aspects. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so let's talk about the production side of things. You said you do about 15 acres of vegetables. Is that all on uh, plastic culture? Um, that Yes, that's exclusive plastic culture. I think we grow an additional 30 acres of sweet corn. Okay. Maybe like four acres of green beans off of the plastic. And are the green beans um, machine harvested or handpicked? Machine harvested. Yeah, we've okay. got an old international tractor from the... <laughs> 70s <laughs> yes yeah yeah awesome um and so then um and then i'm assuming we control as herbicide um when we have to okay yes, but it's not exclusive to that we spend a lot of time out there with traditional hose getting yeah. rid of the weeds um we grow a lot more than just like green beans half runners snap beans yes uh edamame um all of those guys are out there in that field. And and some of those you can't machine harvest. You got to do by hand too. And there yes. are a lot of those unique varieties, which I'm absolutely about. I think we should yeah. protect the varieties that we've been growing for years. Uh -huh. um, they 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 don't like certain herbicides. So it, it, it does rely on hand pruning and, and cultivating. Yeah, yeah. So then um, when does your season typically start? Do you start when, you know, the, the, the first corn is in or you start earlier than, you start with plants, I think you said, right? Yeah, so we, we start in the greenhouses. We have about, yeah. um, I wrote this down. We have about 26,000 square foot of greenhouses. Okay. Um, both in our garden retail center next to the produce stand and yeah. also in our commercial, which is, is about like 600 feet up the hill from our, our okay. produce stand. Yeah. And that's where we grow all of our um, baby plants that we're going to be planting in the field. And their flowers, too. So yeah. right now, those greenhouses are full bloom. They look absolutely beautiful. We open up the produce stand on Friday, this coming Friday. Yep. Before Easter, Easter flowers, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and amen to the flower production because that, that's how, you know, we're at a deficit. We're not making any money all winter long except for snow plowing. And yeah. then, boom, we get some flower money. And that has... There's a reason why so many farmers do yes. flowers in the spring. Well, and the margins are good too. Yeah. If you yeah. grow it yourself, yeah, the, the margins have been really, 
of being going down if you buy it, if you buy out those from other people, because there's so yeah. many other retailers of flowers now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Well, and trying to compete with like a Lowe's or a Home Depot or Menards, where their whole goal is to use that to pull people in to buy other things. So you can't compete on price. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really interesting to look at that and just see what the prices are and then, you know, what we're charging, but, and then trying to stay, and then trying to look at the aspect of how are we differentiating ourselves for that and yeah. uh, trying to make that work. So. And a lot of times people come to us, not for the cheap products. They're not looking for the four inch pot. Yeah. Yeah, they're not looking for the market packs. They want unique species or they yeah. want planters that my mom or my sister has designed or hanging baskets that are very unique, a bunch of different flowers in them. Yeah, um, yeah. And then also the vegetable plants. I always tell our customers the vegetable plants and herbs that we grow here and sell for you are the same plants that we grow out in airfield. We genetically selected these plants to perform well in our area. When you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, they're, they're sending the same plants to probably every single state in the United States. It doesn't matter where it is. So luckily these plants are disease resistant to our soil problems and they can handle our climate a lot better than just general purpose plants. I mean, we've selected these plants for almost a hundred years now on my family's farm for the yes. perfect climate that we have. So that, that's something that they cannot compete against. And also the unique varieties that we grow in the garden center for flowers is very gotcha. with. So then your marketing is most of your marketing done just because of your locations or do you guys actively run like more uh, ads and stuff for your, um, your markets? Um, I try to run Google ads, ads, uh, yeah. not, not really for, I try to focus on the unique stuff that we do. I, yeah. I've, I've always debated whether we should run them just for general produce market, you know, dairy, eggs, vegetables. I, I focus on events like strawberry festival for strawberry picking. Yeah. I focus on, we did a tomato festival in July last year, which I don't know if that was, we're going to do that again. Cause it was, it was so hot. I, nobody wanted to come out. It was so hot and picking tomatoes. It was such a, yeah, not an easy thing. No, um, <laughs> I thought, yeah, I thought, to, yeah, it, it's amazing how few people want to do that. Strawberry picking is kind of, it's spring, it's cooler, and they just enjoy that way better. They get out of the winter smog, you know, like, yeah. boom, let's go do something. And it's strawberries by then. It's warm enough to do it. But I think tomatoes are cooler than strawberries. That's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So then, all right. So you start then, um, and then uh, tell me a little bit about the CSA. How does you, how do you make that work? Yeah. So my sister started that when she graduated from college in 2013. Yeah. And it's slowly grown since then. It's no longer really marketed as a CSA. It's more marketed as like a produce box. You don't really know what a CSA is anymore. Yeah. And also yeah. we've got a lot of uh, adulteration when it comes to the verbiage of a CSA. There's yeah. a lot of people who use it, not a lot of people who are local ag producers. I mean, we've got grocery stores that are running CSA programs now, which is absolutely absurd. I don't know why exactly. USDA doesn't step in and say something because that's that's like label protection. Now. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it, it, CSA program is a great way to bring in unique set of customers who really appreciate and invest in their local food system. I mean, you yes. can't beat those partners. And they literally are partners with the farm i mean they they're welcome to come on a farm whenever they want and look at our produce that are in the field they just have to check in at the produce stand first so they really feel like that they have a a self-investment in what we do and they actually have unique media channels that we can contact them and they can contact us if they have any questions about what we do so yeah it's, it's a great opportunity so do they get any choice at all in what they get in the share or is it exactly what you have put in there great question mike no, they, my sister has a list and she's done this okay. ever since the beginning. This list is pretty darn big. It's like a regular 11 inches long. And yeah. there's about 20 different options on it. Cause we grow such a plethora of different varieties of vegetables. Yeah. yeah. And we sell dairy products too and flowers. So they can choose anything on that list. If it's a full share, they get eight items. If they get, if it's a half share, they get four items. We offer, um, it's a, either a full season, which goes from June to, I think it goes to the end of August. And then they can get a fall season extension that goes from September 
into I think just about to the end of November past Thanksgiving and then they can get a Christmas tree share which is like a wreath and Christmas tree and then cut it themselves at the farm later in the season so it's all you know added on stuff very cool so that's interesting that you run your share through the end of August Mm -hmm. and was was that because of just more keep it super summery or um well it's just we're we're still harvesting everything. We try to we try to not put everything just in the I, I know it's it's a lot of food and it's it's a hefty investment for somebody looking right at the numbers because it is longer. Yeah. Um, and so the comparison is a little bit more complicated. But um I guess when it comes right down to it, it's not gonna be all about the the it's about the growing to us because we actually are the farmers. Yeah. And so that's how long we're harvesting out in the field. And so I just think that the tra- that's how we translated it. That the CSA sh- should last as long as that we are harvesting out in the field. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. We found that we ran our, our summer share through sep- through October, end of October. Cause you know, back in New York, we're going all, we were, our farmer's market quit Thanksgiving day. So we actually ran it all the way through Thanksgiving here we ran it to the end of October and we had people in September saying, oh, I'm still getting vegetables. What's going on? They mm-hmm. really wanted it to be done like, you know, Labor Day um, because kids are going back to school and they're changed and anything like that. So I just thought it was really interesting. That's kind of how they had it all set up and how people expected to get it um, compared to, you know, our expectations. So um, I know yeah. that's such a big drop in Labor Day. Yeah, you're not feeding your kids anymore. <laughs> Maybe we even did that. We extended it past then because yeah. like we're trying to keep the customers coming in and like you got that program, they're yeah. going to come in or else they're losing their own money that they already spent. Exactly. So that's, yeah, so that's the goal there. But um, yeah, we'll see if it actually happens. But so, you guys, you guys, you guys, when do you stop now? Uh, so, well, we, we go year round with our CSA. It's month to month for most of our members, but- um, we do a summer share, which I believe ends, I'd have to go back and look, but I think it ends right at either Labor Day. Um, and then we try to upsell them to go for the fall. Okay. Um, the biggest thing is a lot of people think that, you know, summer, like they think September, like there's no more food after that for some reason. And <laughs> they don't realize, dead. yeah, they think they don't realize that the actual true bounty of a farm usually kicks in right there. I mean, obviously your corn's starting to wind down, but all your fall crops are coming in. And, you know, to us, it's easiest to fill a share in October. That's the super easy because everyone's got, you know, trying to fill jam pack their coolers full and uh, they're more than willing to sell you product. Um, or we're trying to like, fit everything in too. We actually had a hard time fitting anything into the cooler. It's almost empty now, but um, yeah, I was talking to the team how that back in New York, we used to do two 40 foot shipping containers full of, of root vegetables. And um, right now, this year we filled a 20 foot container. And I think next year we're going to have to do a 40 footer. We're going to have to increase our capacity because we just have so much. We just, our CSA is growing and the, the store is now starting to suck a tremendous amount of product. Gotcha. And that's a refrigerated container? Yeah. So you can buy these, um, they're reefer containers and they're 40 foot overseas shipping containers. And they're not, I mean, they're not super, super effective because the insulation is not super, super thick, um, but they will hold, they will hold pretty well. And um, they're pretty effective on price, depending on like the price has gone all over the place recently. Price is dropping right now. Um, But when I think I bought my first one and that would have been back in 20... We 2010, 2011, I think we paid $3,500 delivered for a 40 foot insulated shipping container, which now they're double that at least. Um, but it's still a pretty good deal when you think about, you know, buying a cooler of that square footage mm-hmm. and it's already ready to go outside too. You don't have to worry about, you can set it anywhere and then just throw it back in a truck and away it goes if you need to move it someplace else. So can you plug it in? Um, so typically the, it's typically a three phase power unit that's on it. And typically they're out of us. Uh, they're pretty much junk. So um, <laughs> you basically just rewire your own cooling is what we end up doing. Um, but it's, yeah, you could put a couple of cool bots in or you can put big industrial cooling system. We did the big industrial cooling system and it worked just fine. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah. Gotcha. But if you do the monthly CSA, don't you, wouldn't, don't you think that affects your sales of the long-term CSA? Well, so this is really interesting. And this is something that we are starting to look at. And 
Um, we also offered a self pickup. So they'll pick up in the store and they pick it from the counter or they are doing a, um, that we pick it for them, but they can swap out. And we are still getting, even though the, we put it in a box for you and you can pick anything is more expensive per week. 80% of signups are going for that. So 80% of people still want us to prepack their share and with choice, they want to get their own choice, but they're going to prepack their share. Um, and only 20% are going to pick it up. Now, once the store is operational, people can walk in and see the experience. Um, Cause the store right now we've been operating out of a, a, a bus um, and we just, you know, it's very cramped in there. Not a lot of space, not a lot of options, but when the store is done, it'll be 660 square feet of, you know, again, all the awesomeness Southern Ohio and beyond has to offer. So I'm thinking we'll switch over at that point, but it'll be very interesting to see the buying trends. Um, but back to your question. Yes. I feel like the seasonal one is starting to affect us. I will say though, I think we had about 30 people sign up for a spring green share. So in February, we're like, you know, the greenhouses start really taking off and they're full of greens. And we're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So we did a 12 week green share and we had about 30 people sign up for just that. Um, so, and obviously that was nice because it moved, allowed us to move the kale, the chard, the lettuce and such. And, um, but uh, we only have had a couple people sign up for the summer share. Now, I feel like once we hit strawberry season, which is May and June for us, I bet we'll sign up a tremendous amount of summer share people at that point. Okay, that's good. Um, because, and again, I don't. We'll see how it works. And it's easiest for us to get vegetables in summer. Right now, it's very hard to get enough uh, product because our greenhouses are all switching over from the winter to summer. So half mm -hmm. there's the square footage is out and the the the, the plantings are aging out. Um, so it's just yeah, we're getting a little bit tight on production. Like lettuce has been a little tight for the last couple of weeks. Um, but it's also because we just didn't get a, just didn't get an, a um, planting in in February when we should have. If we had, you know, got a whole section planted with lettuce, we would have been fine right now. Mm, gotcha. So, yes, we are actually still looking for, for some team members. Um, yeah, we're just, again, it's labor. It's labor right now. It's just a challenge. I know what you mean. Yeah. Joining me is Ariel from the Real Organic Project. Ariel, welcome. Thank you. So Ariel, tell us a little bit about what the Real Organic Project stands for. Yeah, so the Real Organic Project is a farmer-led nonprofit uh, that manages an add-on certification for certified organic. And the whole idea is we want to give farmers that are doing things the right way within the spirit of the rules, a way to differentiate themselves from some of the corporate organic on supermarket shelves that only meets the most cynical definition of something that would actually be organic. So what that means is we're only working with farms that are growing their crops in healthy, biologically active soil, as opposed to growing hydroponically. And we're only working with farms that are raising their animals with real access to the outdoor and pastures, as opposed to these confinement operations, which again, unfortunately, are dominating the organic sections of many of our supermarkets. But Michael, I know you're actually interested in potentially pursuing real organic project certification for your farm. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about why, why that's of interest to you? Yeah, I've always been a big proponent of the Real Organic Project because they stand for what I stand for. You know, the feeling about putting the organic back in the ecosystem of the farm. I mean, the problem when you have this corporate organic is that it's been watered down to the lowest common denominator. Then, you know, frequently there's more plastic than plants in some of these systems. Um, real organic is more about caring about those who care about the soil. And, um, you know, going back to that original idea of why we farm organically, which is, you know, we want the birds to be singing in the background and the, the soil to be alive and the earthworms. And when you look at some of these corporate organic, it's just as sterile as um, the conventional farms that we're competing with. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really well put. And I think what we really want to do is find a way to uplift and differentiate the folks that are genuinely doing things the right way for the right reasons and not just finding the simplest, easiest way to check a bunch of boxes. Mm, absolutely. And if folks want to find out more about the Real Organic Project, you can go to realorganicproject.org forward slash thriving farmer. That's realorganicproject.org forward slash thriving farmer. So talk a little bit about um, your team. So it's you and your sister kind of running things now. What kind of uh, crew do you have to help you? Because you're doing a lot. 
Yeah, so primarily we, we we source locally or it's my family members. We have a lot of cousins that help yep. us out on the farm. And um, because there's such a limit of family members, um, oftentimes we do over plant and over plan for what we um, put out in the field. And okay. we don't we don't necessarily get to it taking care of some things or harvesting everything. Um, like the Christmas trees, you know, sometimes you don't get to mowing it when you're supposed to mow it because you just don't have enough labor. It's, it's yeah. you really don't know. You really, it, we kind of, we try to plant things now, like the plastic mulch. You can't beat the labor saving technology of plastic mulch. Yeah. The yeah. weeding is, is not an issue. Um, the watering is so simple. Like, I, those those 15 acres of vegetables you know I, I i got two different locations they both run i used to run electric pumps uh, submersible pumps yeah. now i run the big pumps out of the river or out of the pond and i used to have to spend 10 hours a day at each place in order to get my rotation done on watering but now i just turn on the big pump and i'm done in two hours yeah, it does everything at once. Yeah, you must have some pretty big filters and uh, and he headers though. <laughs> just just uh, just sand filters. Yeah, that we've had filter. forever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, we you, have. Hmm? You back flush those every time you run it, or every couple of weeks. Um, I, I have the pressure gauges on it. Whenever okay. I see a serious drop, I I, I back wash it. Gotcha. But, you know, you keep that suction pipe above the bottom. You really yeah. don't have many problems and you just don't run it when it, when it rained. Cause that, that river stream gets really dirty otherwise. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Let's shift and talk about your, um, the social enterprise, the victory garden side of things. So what was, the, how did that come to be? What was your thought process? And when did you start thinking through that? Well, I kept on getting customers at the Prairie Stand in Edgewood so in, in central Maryland, um, wanting us to grow things for them. Uh -huh. This was like Indian populations, African populations, uh, South American, Central America population, yep. because they realized that it's a desert for culturally relevant food for them. Mm. There's no places in the area. They're forced to conform to what traditional American cuisine is, which is very unfortunate for them. Mm -hmm. um whether mm -hmm. that be like unique varieties of rice if, for example of, of like it, for india like there's that there's that holy basil where they have yeah. to have that open when they pray um every time oh, they pray which is almost every single day herbs like that are super essential for their culture it's almost as essential as like a turkey on our thanksgiving meal except these yeah, people, yeah they don't they don't have that option they can't just go to the grocery store and buy this stuff so um victory gardens is is more about food sovereignty it's giving the people local community the power to grow what they want for themselves and their families mm -hmm. right here so it's empowering everyone to grow food for each other um, and so it's not really like a community garden it's more production based because i'm all about production yeah um, but the community is going to assist in the process and they're going to have a voice in what i grow and it's going to be on the the property well, it is on the property in central Maryland, which is closer to Baltimore. Okay. I'm really gotcha. excited about it. All right. So then you offered, you offer, you offer basically a place for them to come in and grow their own food. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. They get to decide what they want to grow. And then how, how, how big are the plots and how does that all work? Um, I think that this is going to be our first year doing okay. it. The idea was come up with last spring. Yep. Um, so I'll probably end up doing like, probably two rows at a time, probably 800 feet long and probably about like 15 feet wide doing whether it be grains or different vegetable crops. We already do a whole bunch of different eggplants. I just think that in my knowledge of the local soil and the climate might help these, they're primarily immigrant families understand yeah. and navigate a, a, a resource that they do not have access to at all, not in the yeah. slightest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then with that, then are you actively like seeking out like these different varieties for them or the goal is that they bring their own? I could potentially source the varieties for them if they'd like. Um, I think it really the issue, I, it, it's, all, it's all about the money, you know, like I can look as far as wide, as long as my, my penny purse is full. Yeah. Uh, so, so going around and, and, and campaigning for donations, getting the name out there. Yeah. Um, I look 
I, it, I've already started doing it this winter a little bit. That's a lot of fun. I think it's an issue that a lot of people face. And like my family, we came here over the boat from Poland three generations ago. And yes. slowly but surely, all of those cultural cuisines and foods have gone out of the food system. We almost yeah. don't even know what they are. And so this is giving people the option to preserve their cultural heritage, which is a beautiful thing that I think a lot of people so far has been getting behind. And so yeah. I can look for those seeds, whatever they want me to do. I just need to be able to get my name out there, which is what I'm doing. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and then share a little bit about like how are you planning on attracting those people to this? Um, are you do you already have like lists of those people that are interested, or are you um yeah, share a little bit about the the marketing of that? So my involvement in Farm Bureau has really put me in contact with a lot of politicians in my local okay. area on the state level and then county level too. Yeah. Um, and then also just having the the farm the market. Well, we have a farm, we go to two three different farmers markets in Baltimore City. And so there's a lot of issues down there with with um, land rights that we're able to act. We have a lot of contacts down there, but the local politicians like this is a this is a social issue, you know, social yes. enterprise. Yeah, even they like the idea of it. It's a great way for them to help the community that they latch on to. So having a spokesperson in local politics also really helps you get your name out there as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, share a little bit about your involvement in Farm Bureau. Yeah, so Farm Bureau, um, I've been on the board of directors ever since 2018 or 2019, a couple of years now. Okay. Um, it's I, so like growing up, it, it's like I said, it's just my family working on this 300 acre farm. We don't yeah. have time to do anything, whether it be Christmas trees, vegetables. We do a rotation with soybeans and corn that we have a, tra a combine from 1968 to 5,500 John Deere combine. Yep. Huge. That breaks all the time. But we do it all ourselves. And yeah. so I grew up in that culture ever since I was like 10 years old. I've been on the farm, helping my dad, helping my grandfather. And so I, I never had time to engage with the agricultural community in my area. I never did 4-H. I never did FFA. I never had time to yeah. do any of those things. And yeah. so after I got back from college, I realized that um, I don't want to pursue law school. I, I want to stay and help my family because they need me. And they made that very clear. They need my help to keep the farm alive. So yeah. figuring out that I really don't have many connections because I didn't really engage with the community outside of the retail sphere of the produce markets. Yeah. So the Farm Bureau really put me back in touch with agriculture, the agrarian culture in, in, in Hartford County and Maryland. I've met a lot of different farmers um, and, and it really talked to me, which kind of connects to your speech that you did at, at uh, Mid-Atlantic Vegetable Fruit Growers is yeah. that there's a lot of a lot of people look to farmers for leadership. There's not many of us. There, there's only, let's see, yeah. I wrote this, it's a half a percent of the total, it's 2% of the population of the United States are farm and ranch families or come from farm and ranch families. There's not that many of us. We have a very unique profession. We work very hard. Everything that we do is present and available in front of us. You can see the work that you put in and you can take back from it and everybody can, it's visible to everyone. So putting that idea, that narrative into the minds of local farmers in, in this area and, and, and allowing us to rely on the existing leadership structures that we have, um, I think would really be beneficial not just for you know local politics, but just for yeah. the community in general, if they step up and, and, and start narrating their story and their hard work and how important their family is to them and maybe their faith too, it could, yeah. it could really help um, everything about what we yeah. do. Yeah, they're so busy, they don't have time to be the leader that they are in their community. Exactly. So, so, yeah. so integrating that idea that they can step up and they can do some really impactful, make an impactful change for others, it, like you said, it's very hard for farmers. It, there's not much time in a day for them, for them to to go yeah. out into politics and, and do like what you do. But you found a way because you found it was it, it was important. So. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm also a little crazy, so that that also helps. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what would you say is your favorite tool on the farm? Um, my favorite tool. Let's see. Um, I would have to say probably. I'm just going to go with the hand tool. There's okay. a there's a hoe. It's not a regular hoe. It's like a blade. It's like a knife blade. It kind of does like a 
uh, um, a trapezoid. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you slice the weeds from underneath and it rips the plant out and it doesn't rely on you having to pull all the dirt off out of the ground. It okay. just slices the, 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 the weed yep. out. I love those things. It's like a blade, a bladed, um, yeah. is that like a, a push hoe? It would be a push hoe or that'd oh, be like a trapezoid hoe? Too. Okay. Yeah, you can push it too. Like it literally moves like two inches. It has two inch swivel on it. And so you can push it to slice or you can pull it to slice. Oh, like a stirrup hoe. I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Stirrup hoe. I guess that's what it's called. All right. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, that is such a, we love that here on the farm. I'd say there's a lot. <laughs> there's a new tool that Johnny's has. They call it a spring hoe. And we mm -hmm. really like that for the first pass over typically our uh, paper pot, uh, anything that's paper potted. Um, it slices between the rows and it also pushes soil back around the plants and cleans up right around the plants too. So um, we like that. But yeah, stir pose are, are fabulous. It's like yeah. an S shape, like um, uh, this one. No, it's, um, it's uh, the blades come down and it's like a half of a stirrup hoe, but they go out. And then the, the wires are just like wires that go back. And I guess they are maybe a little S shaped in the back, but they go over the plants. And so you're actually pushing them. You push them apart when they go over the plant. And what it does is it basically runs these wires and it just takes the top layer of soil off. There's just a couple of things going on there, but it's kind of, yeah, I'll, just, I'll, I'll put a video up about it. Cause it's pretty nice. Yeah, <clears> and we, and we enjoy really it. Cool. Yeah, yeah, nothing better than working with your hand. That people always ask me, like, you got all these fancy tractors and old tractors. You must love everything, every day, every yeah. second on those things. And I'm like, yeah. I would rather be out using a hoe, being able to talk to people than yes. in a loud tractor. Yeah, so, stuck by yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. cool. Well, um, I think that's yeah, we covered pretty much everything. Is there anything, any final thoughts you want to share before we go? Um, I would say. Uh, agriculture in america is thriving mm -hmm. we're producing more and more yield every single year um the the farm families in america are absolutely inspirational and they they share a lot of lessons that we, everyone can utilize in their own lives um there's not that much disposable income that people spend on agricultural products and food going straight to the farmer mm -hmm. um i think that people really need to start looking at where their food comes from and start investing in their local horticultural agricultural system in order to preserve like the land rights of you to the community um, so that they can grow their own food uh, the food that they want at least um, yeah and so like it's slowly but surely over the over the generations you know less and less of the american disposable income is being spent on food and so yeah. I, I think that if we did increase if we stopped spending on thinking about buying the cheapest food um, we can actually start thinking about preserving like cultural identity, which is what I'm all about. So yeah. if we spend a little bit more money on food, we'll have more local farmers. And, and, and I think everybody will be better community members because of that aspect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today coming on. Appreciate it. Um, can't wait to thank share this much. with the audience. And uh, yeah, it's great to see young folks out there back on the farm, you know, coming back after college and, uh, you know, making it their livelihood and their lifestyle. Um, because yeah, we need, we are aging out. Farmers are rapidly aging out and uh, it's not good to see that. So yeah. thanks for having me, Mike. This was really fun. Well, we, don't be afraid to ask me to come back again. All right. <laughs> after Victory good. Gardens gets a little bigger. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Reese. Yep. See you, Mike. Yep. Bye. Real Organic Project is a farmer-led movement that provides an add-on certification held by over a thousand certified organic family-owned operations across North America. Real Organic Project strives to uplift farms working within the spirit, not just the letter of organic principles. Real Organic Certified Farmers use practices that are centered around the foundational organic principles of soil-based crop production and pasture-based livestock agriculture. To remain accessible to all types of farmers, Real Organic Project fundraises year-round to keep this certification available at no cost to farmers. You can apply today at realorganicproject.org forward slash thriving farmer. That is realorganicproject.org forward slash thriving farmer. The current application season ends soon, so be sure to apply today. So there you have it, another episode in the books. 
So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.